Welcome to a special presentation of the Glendora Historical Society. Tackling the topic of preservation marks 2022 as a milestone year for the Society. Since 1947, we have collected and curated artifacts that tell the story of how we came to be here in our unique locality, time, and condition. This work is stimulating to many, and the core enterprise that has brought together a community of interested and interesting folks. My personal interest is in the preservation of the castle that is held up by the sweat and memory of family and multitudes of friends. The property was given to the society by my uncle Michael in 2005, and 17 years later we are taking our obligation of preservation to new levels with the engagement of new friends from among the architectural preservation community. Every day, millions of people enter old buildings, pass monuments, and gaze at landscapes, unaware that these acts are possible only thanks to the preservation movement. The National Preservation Act was passed in 1966, which is about when we began preparing to build Rubel Castle. Historian Max Page argues that if preservation is to play a central role in building more just communities, it must transform itself to stand against gentrification, work more closely with the environmental sustainability movement, and challenge societies to confront their pasts. I hope that this special presentation tonight will help all of us identify our local opportunities to preserve a piece of history and to tell a story and unite us within the society in its ever more professional approach to our activities. Our intention was to live stream this talk Monday night, but we failed at the technology and lost the first few minutes of the meeting. We now join the meeting in progress with Society President Craig Woods speaking. To begin to understand what we're doing uh, with the castle right now and why it's important. And uh, it's a, right now we're at the stage where we have way more questions than answers. And I think that's a good place to be. Um, from that, we can, we can all learn together. And I want to encourage everyone to, as we go through this process, uh, my phone number is on every newsletter. You can call me with questions that you have about it. Hopefully we can start getting a database with questions and answers to those questions so that we can all learn about this process. Um, I am standing here before you today because in 1993 I asked Michael if he had any vacancies at the, at the farm and he said yes. And I moved in the next day. And it helped me become a better human being. And I don't think I would have the blessings in my life if it wasn't for him saying yes. And it was a small moment in time that changed my life and my children's life and my grandkids' lives forever. And that's what I feel our duty is as members of this community, the Glendor community, to we never know how our good deeds will affect people who are in need of something, of a yes, and, and a, a, a good story that they can identify with and maybe not feel so alone in the world. So it's a privilege to be here before you. Um, we have three wonderful speakers tonight. Donna Williams, unfortunately, had a crane accident and she, <laughs> she couldn't make it. There was a crane, a lake crane or something, so she can't be here. So I'd like to proceed. Chewy Bonilla is gonna be our first speaker. Uh, he is pursuing his master's degree in uh, Heritage Converse Conservation at the University of Southern California and is working as an architectural designer at the firm of Page and Turnbull who is in the process of doing our uh, assessment at the castle right now. So, Julie. Hello. <laughs> and, um, well, Good evening, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Jesus Barba Bonilla. I am an architect uh, speci specializing in heritage conservation and currently working with Patient Turnbull, and I act as a board director at Docomomo US. As Greg mentioned, I'm pursuing my master's in heritage conservation at USC, and I would like to talk to you a little bit of where I come from, and if you allow me, 
from my experience, talk to you what makes something historic for me. And I grew up in Zacatecas, Mexico, uh, which is a colonial mining town declared world heritage by UNESCO. And here is where I become passionate about architecture and history. But it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles when I started realizing and understood that heritage is way more complex than simply old buildings. It's what these buildings represent to people and communities, what makes them special and worth preserving for future generations. And Rubble Castle Historic District has a bunch of these buildings. I've been working with John and Caitlin for the past couple of months on Rubble Castle. And sometimes we often go by thinking that historic refers to old, as something just from the past but is this truly what historic means? The truth is that something from the past is historical, is not historic. So your credit card bank statements are historical, as much as you hate to see them, <laughs> but they're not historic. And the overall meaning of something historic has been changing throughout time. What was historic to our grandparents may not be the same as we consider historic today. And that's why, to me, something historic is something that has changed the course of a human society. It's something that changed our mindset, and something whose, ram uh, whose ramifications have reached so many people that its importance is undeniable. In the past, we consider historic only those buildings that had something to do with the rise of our nation. Independence, Civil War, and the work of renowned architects. And all of these sites are very important. But oftentimes, they don't represent everyone in the community. So as, as an immigrant, I've always thought that America's biggest virtue is a melting pot a place where dreams come true and where people can be themselves. And the only way this is possible today is because of people before us set the path. They opened frontiers and stood for their ideals. People like Michael Rubel, who reached so many people in this community that he helped shape what Glendora looks like to us today. And that's what's historic to me. So, did you know that uh, Michael's friend, Glenn Spear, who lived in the Rubel Castle for many years and helped him build a lot of the stairs and woodwork uh, in most of the Citrus Ranch buildings, at some point moved to the Virgin Islands and became one of the most rec recognized architects down there. He built the Mongoose Junction in the island of St. John which is today a landmark and the most tourist place, if you ever visit. And that all started here, at Rubble Castle, because they both shared the same ideals. And so we, we have some guidelines, right, um, that help us recognize and, and protect historic properties at state and national level. But these guidelines sometimes do not completely embrace what heritage means to people. Heritage is the base of our society. It's the journey, it's the ideals, it's the dream. It's what makes us what we are today. <coughs> and heritage is not always something that we can touch, and this makes it really complex. Sometimes it's something that you can feel, like pride, or something that you can hear like music, or read like poetry. Sometimes it's something that helps you remember, like traditions. But it is important that we pass on this heritage to all the future generations. And one way to do this is to find those physical elements that are connected and linked to this heritage. This is where places like Rubble Castle, the objects, the buildings, everything comes in play. Because these sites are going to live, if we allow them, 
way more than any of us. I would also like to touch and make a parenthesis here between what is conservation versus preservation. Uh, because we talk about both things and oftentimes it's a little bit confusing. But the main difference is that conservation is sought to regulate human use while preservation is sought to eliminate human impact altogether. And I'm making this point right here because it's very important to make sure that the places that we love and that we're trying to protect continue living instead of just becoming empty carcasses. And Michael Rubel understood this. He made of Rubel Castle one of the first major recycling projects of the United States. <laughs> and we're talking about an era where global warming wasn't even in the picture. And that to me is groundbreaking. That's why I think it's up to us conservationists to make sure that our heritage continues to exist and grow as new generations come by. Because heritage conservation is not a hobby. It's an important undertaking. It's make, making sure that future generations understand where we're coming from so the mistakes of, of the past are not repeated. And we do this by protecting the stories that will continue to inspire. Thank you. Thank you, Chewy. Chewy, what was the first thing that made the biggest impression when you came in onto the castle grounds? The first thing, I couldn't describe it as one thing. It was everything. It's a place that like pulls you everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's something different, there's something unique, there's something that means something to somebody. And that is incredible. I couldn't say some something is more important than the other because it's a whole district yeah. and it's it's one whole thing right. and just finding out uh, it's like a scavenger hunt when you're there you can spend days and i'm pretty sure people here have spent years and they can find something new every time they walk in i can attest to that <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's just the whole site that did it for me there's a lot of visual stimulation. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Chewy, very much. You're welcome. And thank you for working on the project oh, with yeah. us. <laughs> Next up is John Lisek. He is the principal in charge of the Los Angeles office of Page and Turnbull, which is a full service architecture design planning and preservation firm. He's on the faculty of USC's Heritage Conservation Program, South Pasadena Commission Chair, and he's worked on many cool historic properties. And John is kind of leading the charge, putting all this information together for us that we will process and, and help us tell our story and a bunch of other things. So, John Lysak. So one of the things that I do at USC is I teach <coughs> sustainability and heritage conservation. Because really, you know, preserving a place is a sustainable act. It's probably the most sustainable thing we do. Um, so it's a natural fit. So when I think about places and projects like um, Rubel Castle, I think of them in, really in terms of a triple bottom line for people who know sustainability, right? So we think about people, we think about planet, and we think about profits. So it's more economy, environment, and uh, equity, right? So you can't really divorce those things from maintaining a historic site, preserving or conserving a historic site. You really need to think of it holistically as an interconnected uh, group of things. And really, people are very important in that process. She was right when he talks about people and heritage sites. My slides are a little out of order, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump around a little bit, but we're here to uh, put together a, a preservation plan. Right? So I'm supposed to talk about what a preservation plan is. I think in terms of time a lot, so what a preservation plan does is it gives you a snapshot of the past. It gives you 
a snapshot of the present, and then it um, makes you think about the future. One of my mentors, Jay Turnbull, who's a founder of our firm, used to always like to quote Eisenhower. He said, you know, plans change, and you know, anybody who's lived through COVID knows that plans change. But uh, planning is essential. You know, going through the act of mm -hmm. consciously thinking about the future of a place mm -hmm. or an organization or even a family is, uh, is, is critical. So what we're doing is we're, we're planning. So we're collecting information uh, about the past and the present. And then we're working together as a group. You know, what, what should the future of Rubble Castle be? And I like to say, yes, yeah, Scott said, it's a, it's, a, it's a group effort. We're working together on this. It's not Page and Turnbull's plan. It's, it's the Glendora Historic Society's plan. All right, so we're just helping you put it together. And that's our, our job. Parts of a preservation plan, you need research. You need to develop kind of historic stuff. And a lot of that's been done already for, for the castle and the district. Um, you need to document things. Uh, we're focused on condition. You need to assess. There's physical, there's financial, there's kind of people parts, there's compliance parts. And then from there, you start to work through a set of scenarios or treatments or plans for the future. So I'm going to go through those in a little bit more detail. So we start with kind of uh, what makes a place historic. So there's three things kind of that a place needs to be historic. It needs to fit into history, right? It needs to have a historic context. So historic contexts are organized by places by time periods and by themes. So you can have all kinds of themes. We do a lot of work for NASA and we do lots of science themes, right? The space shuttle and the development of the space program <laughs> is an important theme in the, in the history of the United States. For the castle, there's kind of Michael and what they're calling a folk art uh, period um, where the castle part happened, but there's also an agricultural part and the develop of Southern California in the San Gabriel Valley is really a kind of an agricultural and economic powerhouse right at the beginning, late 19th, early 20th century, right? So both those things exist here. So there's more than one historic context for the site. The second piece is that place needs to be significant within that history. It needs to mean something. Just because it stuff happened around it um, doesn't really mean a lot. It has to be significant. And significance falls into different categories. You've got four different categories. You've got um, ha events or pattern of events. So the development of agriculture in the San Gabriel Valley is, falls into that category. You've had uh, people, uh, notable people. So Michael is definitely notable in Glendora and in uh, the area, San Gabriel Valley. You have design, and that could be uh, something of a particular style or it could be something more freeform and vernacular, like uh, the castle itself. And then also, the last part of that, there's four, is kind of archaeology. Could it tell us something about prehistory, right? So that's important too. That doesn't, we haven't seen that here. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And then um, we have integrity, right? So this is historic integrity. And that means the place has to have enough stuff left so it can tell why it's significant within history, right? It has to have the physical features to convey it. And uh, the historic district definitely has these things. So these are the breakdowns, um, so you can look at them in the future. Um, integrity has seven things, and I'm not going to go into it for interest of time. It's important to think about all those different things. When we're preserving things, we really look at integrity, and we look at kind of what we call character defining features, right? Those are the unique features that convey that significance of place. And, you know, believe me, the um, castle's loaded with them. But we also have spaces and spatial relationships. So when you walk into the castle, there's a negative space between all the different buildings and all the different structures and the towers and bridges. Those spaces mean something too. And that relationship of space means something too. And that's something we want to make sure we preserve. And character-defining features are really kind of 
architectural composites, but they're also the individual materials that make put that together. Right? So that's what we're concentrating, observing, and we spent time kind of listing those and documenting those, and there's multiple buildings and multiple structures, and we've got a list of that for the, the whole site. So what we're doing now is a conditions assessment. So we're really looking and going through all the bits and pieces of the buildings. So we look at architectural um, components, so the walls, the windows, the roofs, the interior finishes. Um, we look at uh, egress and access to the site. We look at all the different systems, so structural system, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Uh, plumbing breaks down into a lot of stuff, particularly here. There's air and gas and water and sewage. Um, so uh, figuring out all those different pieces is kind of what we're doing. So you, when you asked Chewy about kind of what struck you, the masonry struck me because I was fortunate to work on kind of all these masonry buildings of the Grand Canyon, which really is just striking kind of stone masonry. So once we get through that, we start to think about how to treat uh, the property. So there's broad categories of treatment. Um, these are the ones that are in the Secretary's standards. They're um, pretty typical. We're taking these and we're refining them a little bit. Preservation is the act of keeping something the same. So you have to do maintenance in order to keep something the same. Restoration is taking something back to a specific time period. So you're going to, you might remove some stuff, you might add some stuff back. Rehabilitation is about updated uses or new uses. So adaptive reuse is typically a uh, rehabilitation. And then reconstruction is when there's an unfortunate event and something gets wiped out. Um, so you can restore it back to the way it was. But you have to build it new. And then there's bits and pieces of this um, under rehabilitation as architects. That's kind of the one we work on the most. There would probably be pieces of Ruble Castle that get rehabilitated because we'd want to add in a you know, better electrical system or um, maybe some better access or egress, so there may be some changes involved. Um, but a lot of it will be preservation. And then we came up with um, some other categories. So one is mothballing, so that's basically a form of preservation where you stabilize something for the future. Um, I've been involved in uh, several earthquakes and planning after earthquakes and we did a lot of mothballing because we realized we weren't going to fix it tomorrow but in five years we'll have the money and the time to do it. So mothballing was really important. Um, and then we came up with uh, folk art adaptation as a category. So in the spirit of the castle and the artistic work that went on, how can we continue that throughout the site? So we, we've created a series of categories specific to the castle and we've kind of um, started to zone the different pieces. We call it or re uh, preservation zoning is what we call it. And we started to apply that to the site. So um, that's going on. All in all, it's in reasonably good condition. And then we start to look at treatments, right? We can look at specific conservation treatments. This is out at Santa Monica. This is a Julia Morgan. It's part of a pool and it's decorative tile. It's a fish mosaic. And we've been looking at specific conservation treatments there, and there's um, kind of artifacts and art that the uh, castle will need that, that sort of thing, like vacuum cleaners built into the wall or kind of gloves. <laughs> Those things aren't designed to last outside for you know, 50 years, so we have to figure out how to conserve those things. We want the last kind of part of a preservation plan are recommendations. So we're gonna recommend things that need immediate treatment, we're going to recommend things that are high priority. Uh, we'll recommend, we'll talk about things that are lower priority. And then we'll uh, talk about maintenance items that are cyclic, so you need to do them periodically. But when we do that, we want to, in order to prioritize, we need to look at significance, the historic significance. We need to look at um, use and use intensity. So if someone lives there, that's more important than a building that, that people don't use. Um, we want to look at cost. And then um, we want to look at current and, and future use, too. So those are the things, and we're working, we're going to work together collaboratively. That's kind of the stage we're at now to start to look at all these different pieces, parts uh, to build up the plan. But I, I believe that historic preservation isn't about the past, it's about the future. We're going to make decisions about what we keep, how we interpret it, how we think about it, 
And I think that's endemic in our society. When you look at a movie like Blade Runner, they used historic sites to, to film Blade Runner and to kind of demonstrate the future. Granted, it wasn't a great future, but we, uh, we, we used it anyway. And same, I, I worked on the Marin County Civic Center a long time ago, so I uh, like this one too, the movie Gattaca also talked about the future and the, basically the uh, flight school for, for uh, interstellar travel is at uh, Frank Lloyd Wright building, right? So we want to keep these things because they tell a very important story. And we want to make sure the future generations, like kind of like sustainability, have the opportunity to take that, this place, this resource, and make it their own too. So that's the act of conservation. So with that, I'll, um, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's, it's, uh, I didn't know exactly what the dream was a year and a half ago when we started really getting serious about, but it's coming true. And thank you for your leadership and, and guidance. It's, it's a pleasure to be and it's working with you. It's really a, it's such an amazing place. It's really a blessing to be able to work on it. Oh, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for, for John? I have a general uh, question about the term district. Yeah. Uh, is the district the castle only? I mean, the property? Because we have neighbors now who say, oh, I live in the, in the Rubel Castle Historic District. Yeah. And I think that's cool that they're proud of that. You know, but it's an official term, right? Uh -huh. So it's, uh, it's in the National Register of Historic Places recorded in the Library of Congress. And the district there has a boundary. And the boundary is basically the property. Our wall. Yeah. Right. Okay. You can expand the district. Yeah. <laughs> Way in the back, Hans. Yeah, I was wondering if, if John has a, a you know, what, what he's learned so far about the castle is, is, does he feel like we should be going in a, cons, as a conser, conservation direction or a restoration direction? Well, restoration's tricky. I actually think he should be going in a rehabilitation um, direction. And I, and I think that because I like to see places used. It's kind of like Chu was saying. Um, I think places are most vibrant and live out best when they're actively used. So figuring out um, what those uses are, and there's so much kind of art and craft that goes on there and has gone on there. Um, that makes sense, people live there. You know, making appropriate changes to the place that allow that use to intensify or the uses to continue in a, in a safe of a way as possible uh, is um, kind of the direction that I think. So that's conserving pieces and that's upgrading pieces. That, that's what I was going to ask you next. So isn't that conservation and rehabilitation are almost the same? They're, diff they're different because conservation and rehabilitation are, are close to being the same. Preservation and rehabilitation are different. Mm -hmm. There are places that should be preserved, and parts of this should be preserved, but I think in, in a lot of ways it should be a more active effort. So conservation makes a lot more sense. Go ahead. Uh, um, how Blue much uh, ADA standards come into play? Um, well, that's, so that's the trick, and that's kind of where we're at now. So what's interesting is, and this is something that a lot of folks don't understand, is when a building's built, to a code, even that when that code's in the past, it's code compliant. And until you change something, that building is code compliant. And then when you change something, that piece that you change needs to be brought to contemporary standards. So, the issue with Rubel Castle is it really wasn't built to a code. <laughs> um, but, you know, things from the past don't necessarily have to be brought to um, contemporary accessibility codes or um, other types of codes, unless you start to monkey with it. The castle's different. You know, we're working our way through a strategy that provides kind of equitable access, but maybe not necessarily co-compliant access. So we'll get co-compliant access to certain places, but you're not going to get, you're just not going to get uh, co-compliant access to all the places there. So how do we make sure that people can get an equitable experience visiting the castle or living in the castle or taking an art class in the castle? 
that's the question and the challenge. But I think that's uh, more doable than saying, hey, I gotta bring this whole thing to code. So a lot of that can be done virtually now too. We can have online right. tours, virtual tours, where people who can't have access to the, to the Tin Palace can experience the Tin Palace. So we're working on those ideas right now okay. to try and make that happen. So the building codes in general have a historic section, and California has a standalone historic historical building code, <coughs> and access it's more kind of egress and stairs and things don't necessarily have to be upgraded uh, as long as you can get equivalency. So that's a challenge. Karen, did you have a question? Uh, well, I was just wondering how you would um, distinguish the folk art aspect from the citrus period, the citrus industry. Kind of a there's a mishmash, but there's a there's pretty clear division in the castle itself, right? Mm -hmm. Castle's a castle, and then you get out, and you do have kind of clear agricultural buildings. You mean you have kind of the former storage shed that's become the tin palace. So you do have kind of a bifurcation of time periods, and that's that's really kind of how it was done. Yeah, we were actually didn't do it. It was done in the National Register nomination. Um, so we're figuring out the best way to kind of interpret the feedback. We try to rank things because we think it's important to say what the most significant piece is. And I would, you know, to me the castle itself is the most significant piece because it's the most unique. There's, flat, there's lots of agricultural buildings around, in and around Southern California. You know, some of them have been adapted and reused as different things, but there's no, there's no castle. So anyway, we kind of say this is a primary significance, this is a secondary significance. It doesn't mean it's not significant. It's just if we have to make decisions like where to spend money first, that's why we're trying to wait. You know, mm -hmm. we wait condition. You know, if it's unsafe, then that leaps forward ahead of kind of significance. But we're taking significance and condition, and use, and all these things, and trying to create a prioritization matrix that makes sense and can guide future activity itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, thank you, John. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, next up is the woman, Caitlin Drisco, the woman who's been shepherding us mm -hmm. through this process. Um, I think we sat, I met you three years ago, four years ago mm -hmm. at your studio. Mm -hmm. And the thing that built the castle is perseverance. And Caitlin's persevered through many hurdles and challenges, fired us once, <laughs> came on as volunteer, and has just been doing an outstanding job uh, co-chairing the ad hoc contract committee. And in her bio here, it says she has a reputation for sympathet sympathetic architectural solutions developed in a collaborative team environment. And that suits us perfectly. That, if that's not the spirit of Michael Rebell, I don't know what it is. And so she's been uh, one of the uh, founders and owners of Drisco Studios since 2002. And so, Caitlin, I'll need your help to find your... That's okay. We're just going to leave this slide up. This is, okay. this is what Great. my whole talk is about. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here see a lot of really familiar faces and some new ones and I look forward to meeting all of you. It's an extraordinary place and being able to come out to Glendora and learn about this place which is which really wasn't very well known. My practice is almost entirely typically in downtown Los Angeles or the, the west side and so learning about this treasure here has just been a pleasure. Um, so I thought I'd start, I'll, I'll, I'm going to merge their two talks a little bit and kind of explain where we go next. I'm, I'm so happy that you all allowed me to stay and join the ad hoc committee and um, get to work with extraordinary professionals. Um, this is really a joy. So as John and John mentioned, and if Donna were here, she, she, she's sorry she couldn't make it, she would say that, that she has what she calls a preservation toolkit, that there's really 
ways to start to think about a project that makes something that's big and complicated suddenly seem a little less daunting. And uh, John's touched on a few of them that you kind of start with what do we have? So inventory, documentation. Don is typically walks around and as John and Chewy have been doing at Page and Turnbull and you'll see some of their report, reports eventually going to every space, photographing it. And the inventory part is trying to give things names because once you can recognize something by a name, you begin to, to understand what it's made out of, what its purpose is, how it got there. So the next thing is maintaining something. Just while you're in this whole process, you've all been maintaining something for all these years, and you just keep doing it. And in, in some cases, you start to get ahead of the deferred part, and you start into this um, preventative kind of conservation mode. And Donna's helping you all get towards that. And then you have these long, short, me I guess short, medium, and long range strategies you start to develop. What can we deal with right now? And I know Donna's been doing some cleaning and curated curatorial um, exercises. And then what can we do in the medium run to just continue the use of the place and what's the long-term strategy? And then there's two other parts we haven't really talked about yet today, which are headed towards some of your questions. It's starting to develop um, what do you want for institutional growth? Where are you going to go next? Because to keep this place living, it needs to continue to be used. And how do you develop governance and policies that will allow you to allow keep that going towards the future? With those five things, inventory, maintenance, strategies, governance, and policies, and thinking about what your institutional growth are, those are the ways that you just take five quick things and if you can start any one of those, you've suddenly started to make big things seem manageable. Here today, though, that's all how we deal with the, the, the object, the thing. What we're really here today is because we have had all these amazing people and professionals we're working with because of one man's original vision, Michael's vision, brought us all here today, because of the foreign hands who helped him build that through all the time, through the, the farmhands now that are continuing to maintenance, because of those who live and work and volunteer at the castle, and because of the community of Glendora that continues to maintain it. So this is much about the, pa it's much about the past as it is about the future. Today, what do we care about? How do we take care enough of this place and teach others about it? Much of what we, let, what we let go of, it is left in photos, books, documentation, stories. But here we have a real physical object that we can preserve, the artifacts, the buildings, the places. But what is special about the castle is how that place can inspire and teach so many people. It reminds us of what story we would like to tell about Michael, about us, about the people who take care of the place and about our own community. Those stories um, range from people who could be inspired by collecting, like just the small things that you walk around and see new every day when you walk around in the castle, to grand things and grand observations like building castles, castle building. Things that can inspire and transform people's lives are looking at how Michael tre treasured things as inventions and he was inventing things, but he was also incredibly creative using, uh, using existing things and creating new things out of existing things. Ranges all the way from the science to the art and from a single person, Michael, to the collection of all of us here today. These are powerful stories. They have the power to transform people when they walk into the castle. So today, we're all here today because we're all stewards um, for both the place, we're going to preserve it or conserve it, and the people. Um, and I think Craig mentioned, it's actually written out that the, Michael really wanted the place to be a living museum. It's not a place that we're going to set in aspect. It needs to be maintained in perpetuity. It's a place that's going to be set in the spirit, in the folk art spirit, and be collectively appreciated. 
And it's through friendship and good work and collaboration that Michael built the place. And that's the way we're going to continue to see it. And it's a dichotomy. Because much like I, I do quite a bit of work for the National Park Service, and the Park Service has two main missions. One is to preserve the environment so we can all share it and visit it. But it's by the mere act of greatly sharing it that to some extent creates a deterioration of the very environment that it's trying to preserve. In some cases, we have that exact same situation here. And these are the challenges that John is talking about, to be able to find ways to keep the building in use and keep people there, but still preserving it. So we look at how things, as John mentioned, we're going to be looking at things economically, feasibly, scientifically, and artistically. And these are the big questions all of us have as stewards. What our big question is, who will we share these stories with in the future? The what, the how, the when, and the how much, those are the easier things that the professionals and you all together can do. So this is just the start of a conversation. And you're seeing John start to, uh, and Chewy start to wrangle with what some of these questions are. But the real question is about the future. It's not the past. Where do we want this place to go? And how do we want to get there? So I think that's, a, that's, that's what our, our big uh, hurdle will be next. <laughs> It's so inspirational to hear you give wor put words to, to, a, to our mission like that. Um, it's been something that I think a lot of us have known deep in our hearts for a, a long time, but to articulate it has been challenging because it's like picking one of those, picking the most important thing or the most impactful thing of the castle, it's impossible. And the impact that the, the castle and the museum and this community has had on people is worth uh, us putting the work into to really learn how to articulate it and figure out what we're going to do about it. And that's our, that's our job. That's our job as this, for this society, is to figure that out, and we are going to do that. So in closing, I want to really thank you all for coming. And thank you, Sue, for our hospitality chair to bringing the... Thank you to the Glendora um, uh, Library to have this wonderful air-conditioned yeah. space for us to be in and all the visual stuff. And thank you, Caitlin and Linda, for not running away from this idea when I put it up to you. So I had this a couple of weeks ago. Um, thanks for doing it. And Scott, thank you for publishing it in the newsletter. And Anita for sending out all the great email reminders. Anything else? I think we're done. Thank you so much for coming.